You're out for a walk. It's a beautiful day. Open prairie stretching to the horizon. And then you hear a sharp chirp from a small, cute rodent popping up from its burrow. But here's what you don't know. That prairie dog just told every single one of its neighbors exactly what you look like. Not just that you're human, but your height, your build. If you're running or walking, even the color of your shirt. This is published science. For centuries, we dismissed these chirps as meaningless squeaks, just scared rodents making scared sounds. We were spectacularly wrong. These are descriptions, adjectives, maybe even sentences. And the reason they evolved this stunningly detailed system isn't just for gossip. It's the backbone holding together a subterranean civilization so complex it rivals a medieval city, complete with architects, family feuds, and constant subtle chatter between them whose meaning we're just beginning to understand. The story begins with a professor named Konstantin Slobjikov. Back in the 1970s, he was studying Gunnison's prairie dogs. And like everyone else, he assumed the barks were just barks. But a colleague gave him a nudge. He suggested Slobodjakov check if the calls were different for predators coming from the sky, like a hawk, versus those on the ground, like a coyote. He went out, recorded the calls, and when he analyzed the sound waves, it was clear as Day. The alarm call for a hawk was completely different from the call for a coyote. This was the start of a multi-decade long journey where he discovered that prairie dog communication went so much further than he could have ever imagined. The calls weren't just, I'm scared. They were danger from above versus danger on the ground. And this makes perfect sense for survival. If a hawk is diving, you get underground instantly as the threat will come and go extremely quickly. But if it's a coyote, they run to a burrow or close to one, then watch the threat closely. If a coyote sees a prairie dog dive into a hole, it may wait it out. Different calls, different threats, different survival strategies. This discovery opened the floodgates. Slobodjakov found they had specific words for badgers, for humans, they could even tell apart a coyote from a German shepherd. But they noticed something unexpected. The human alarm call seemed to change. So they designed a simple experiment. They had four human volunteers, all of the same build, walk through the prairie dog town. The only difference was that each person wore a different colored t-shirt, blue, yellow, green, or gray. When they analyzed the recordings, the results were stunning. The prairie dogs had created consistently different alarm calls for each color. They weren't just saying human. They were saying human in a blue shirt. So the team pushed it further. They tested for height. A tall person got a different call than a short person. They tested for body shape. A thin person got a different call than a bigger person. They were packing specific, descriptive, adjective-like information into that single tenth of a second chirp. They even discovered the prairie dogs had a specific modification to their human call if that human was carrying a gun. Think about the fluid intelligence that requires. Guns were not created all that long ago. Natural selection hasn't had that much time to instill this into their instincts. They have to recognize the human, recognize the object, understand that the object fundamentally changes the nature of the threat, and then encode that specific combination into a unique sound that the rest of the city understands. And when I say city, I mean a network of thousands of individuals, all depending on this information network to survive. And this understanding of the threat persists. Have that same person come back at a later time with no gun, and the call stays the same. 
They remember this person once carried something that could get them killed. This isn't just a meaningless bark. This is a show of intelligence, unlike anything we see in other rodents. This begs another question. Can they invent new, quote unquote, words? When researchers flew a large black oval over their colony, they created a brand new, consistent call for it. They saw something they'd never seen before. And as a community agreed on a word or possibly even a series of distinct sounds that describe that object. And remember, these chirps last about one tenth of a second. So how do they pack so much into so little? When you slow the calls down, you find the chirp isn't one sound. It's built from discrete segments. The beginning identifies the general category, human, hawk, coyote. Then you have the modifiers. Tiny frequency shifts can encode size. Changes in the harmonics can indicate speed. Additional overtones appear for colors. It's like they're speaking in compressed audio files, a system of incredible efficiency. This shatters the old idea of animal communication being a fixed set of grunts. It forces us to ask, is this language? Some might argue it is because just like humans, prairie dogs have regional dialects. The call for fast coyote in a colony in Texas can be measurably different from the fast coyote call in Montana. This is a monumental discovery because complex dialects aren't typically instinctual. They're learned. They are a hallmark of culture passed down from one generation to the next. Now, to a linguist, language has a very specific definition. It's not just about having words for things. It's about having grammar. Rules for combining those words to create nearly infinite new meanings. Think of it like this. Is a prairie dog's brain a giant dictionary with a preset list of words for every possible thing? A word for coyote, a separate word for fast coyote, another for human, and a different one for tall human in a blue shirt? Or is it more like humans with separate words with what's called compositionality? We know about all the changes they make to the barks to encode different meaning. But what we don't know if there's anything that represents syntax, the order of words. In English, dog bites man is very different from man bites dog. So far, there's no evidence that the order of sounds in a prairie dog call changes the meaning. But we also don't have evidence that it doesn't. Proving that would be the holy grail of this research. So when we ask, is it truly language? The honest scientific answer is maybe. This is the modern day cutting edge research. It has the words, the descriptions, but we don't yet know if it has the grammar engine that makes human language so powerful. But perhaps we've been asking the question from the wrong angle. The most profound question isn't just what are they saying? The real question is what kind of society has problems so sophisticated that it needs a vocabulary for the color of your shirt? The answer is in the massive networks under the ground. From the surface, you might assume that these are just shallow holes they dive into for protection but they're actually closer to the complexities of the better known ant colonies. They are architects of vast subterranean cities. These burrows can be 35 feet long and 10 feet deep with multiple entrances. They have separate chambers for sleeping, for nurseries, for food storage, and even designated toilet chambers to keep their main chambers clean. They are even masters of passive ventilation. By building their mounds at different heights, 
they use a physics concept called Bernoulli's principle. The faster moving air over the taller mound creates lower pressure, which literally sucks stale air out while fresh air is pulled in through the shorter mounds. Their entire city breathes. Within these cities, they have a social structure as layered as our own. You have the city or colony with hundreds up to thousands of individuals. Then each colony is divided into wards, like neighborhoods with roughly 50 individuals each. And wards are made up of coteries, the family unit. They recognize family with a greeting kiss which is actually a scent-based password check. Get the password wrong and you're chased out immediately as burrows aren't shared by others in the ward. And this communication isn't just vocal, it's physical. When a threat is gone, black-tailed prairie dogs perform a jump yip, a loud two-toned yip, while throwing themselves into the air. It's an all-clear signal but it's also contagious. One prairie dog does it, then its neighbor, then its neighbor's neighbor. It spreads like a shockwave across the city. Just like in humans, the constant high stakes social environment is what drove the evolution of their language. But their importance goes far beyond their own society. Prairie dogs are what's known as keystone species. In an arch, the keystone is the stone at the top that holds all the others in place. Remove it, and the entire structure fails. In an ecosystem, that's the prairie dog. At least 170 other species depend on them. Their burrows provide ready-made homes for burrowing owls, rattlesnakes, and countless other creatures. It aerates the soil, reduces erosion, and performs countless other ecologically important functions. With this importance also comes darkness. Life in a prairie dog town is a strange mix of deep cooperation, but also betrayal that you wouldn't expect. After pups are born, blind and helpless underground, the lactating females in a family will often commit infanticide, killing their own kin. Studies have shown that a female that does this will end up with more overall surviving offspring than those that don't. But weeks later, after the surviving pups emerge, those same murderous females will communally nurse the remaining young, allowing their nieces and nephews to thrive alongside their own offspring. A two-stage strategy. First, secure an individual advantage. Then, switch to a group strategy to ensure the family and its shared genes survives. But this complex world is disappearing. At their peak, prairie dogs numbered in the billions. The largest single colony ever documented in Texas covered an area the size of West Virginia. Today, their populations have crashed by over 98%. For over a century, they were the target of systematic, government-sanctioned poisoning and shooting campaigns, all fueled by flawed science that labeled them as pests. But the greatest threat today is an invisible invader we brought with us, Sylvatic Plague. It's caused by the same bacterium as the famous bubonic plague, and to prairie dogs who have zero natural immunity, a single outbreak can silence an entire city in a matter of weeks. And this catastrophic loss exposes a fundamental 
flaw in how we see the world. A bias known as the shifting baseline syndrome. We look at the millions of prairie dogs that exist today and we think they're doing fine. We might even call it a conservation success story. We forget that today's quote unquote abundance is a mere ghost of their historic population. Our baseline for what is normal has shifted so far down we no longer recognize the scale of the ruins we're standing on. We don't just see fewer animals, we hear less language. Entire dialects have vanished from the planet before we even knew they existed. The ultimate tragedy is not just that we're losing a keystone species, it's that we are finally learning to listen just in time to hear the silence.